Hello, God bless you. Welcome to this daily video where we take a daily look at the Bible verse. Because just like when we get hungry, we feed our bodies, our physical bodies. We also need to feed our spiritual bodies. And we do that by reading the Bible. By opening the Bible, reading the Word for yourself, getting along with God, praying to Him, seeking His face. You can read a physical copy of the Bible. You can read a free Bible app or one of the various websites. We give you an appetizer, a verse of the day with some discussions, and hopes that you will open your Bible, you read the verses before and after we discuss today, that you will feast on the spread of life, which is the Bible, the Word of God, that you will see God's face, see God's presence, seek to be filled with that living water, the Spirit of God, that will give you strength to endure anything that you may be going through. Today we're going to do something we've never done on these daily videos. We're going to cover six verses. Just because they all kind of go hand in hand. And you'll see what I mean here in a moment. We're going to be in the book of Psalms. One of my favorite books. Psalm 139. We're going to read 7 through 12. So open your Bibles, follow along, or follow along on the screen. And it says... Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Excuse me. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand Lead me, in thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. You see, these verses are talking about that we cannot hide from God. God's Holy Spirit, or the Spirit as it calls it, another name for God. And if we go up to heaven, or we go down into the depths of hell, God will find us. If we go to the east or we go to the west, we cannot hide from God. His hand or His power will always be with us. We can we cannot see in the dark, us physically. We did a scripture about the light of the world and walking in darkness a few days ago from John three nineteen. And we talked in also in the day before in John eight twelve when we talked about Jesus being the light of the world and we talked about how if you have if there's a blackout you're stumbling around trying to find a lighter, matches, candles, lanterns, flashlights, whatever it may be. But you're stumbling around in the dark. We can't see in the dark. But God can. There's nowhere that we can go. No height we can climb. No depths we can reach. Where God is not where they're with us. So what I mean by this. Is whatever you're going through in your in this life, you know, we give you these for the past few months we've been giving you these scriptures showing you that you can run to God with whatever you're going through. You see, there's nowhere you can escape God. So go to him with whatever. You know, there's a lot of times that we in life we we may try to run as far and fast away from God as we can. We want to do it on our own. But what these verses are telling us is there is nowhere, nowhere you can go. You know, we like to hide this sin, this part of our life, this deed we've done, something that we don't want our friends to know, we don't want our family to know, and we hide it in our, we hide it deep inside us. Never want to let it see the light of day. Don't want anybody to know about it. But God knows about it. 
There's nothing we can hide from him. So put your faith and trust in him. Run to him, don't run away from him. You know, and today, as I'm recording this, in our Sunday school lesson at church, we were reading the prodigal son. And when you think about that story, it's in Luke chapter 15, if you want to read Luke chapter 15. The son asked for his inheritance. He blew it on everything that we blow our money in this world for. Probably partying and whatever. He had all these friends. When he had all this money, his inheritance money, he had all these friends, but he lost his inheritance. His friends went away. There was a famine. He started working, helping out with this person with this these pigs, these swine. And he was kind of shepherding this, these pigs. And he was so desperate that these husks that these pigs were eating, you know, he, he, he desired that if he could just have that, those husks. So he says, you know what, I'm going, I'm going to go back to my father. I've, I've, I've lived such a wretched life by leaving him that I know that I can never be his son again. But maybe he will have mercy on me and he'll let me be his slave, his servant. So he goes back to his house. Ready to leave a little humble pie, but he didn't think that his dad would ever accept him as his son again because but maybe I, maybe I can maybe I can beg him to let me work for him to be a servant. His dad sees him coming down the road. He doesn't wait for his son to get there and say, "I'm sorry, Dad." This the son does not. I mean, everything that that I just said about how he was saying, "Well, maybe I can be a servant." That was all while he's watching these swine, these pigs eat this food or maybe on his journey but he he hadn't said anything to his dad all he thought was I'm just going to go there but as he's walking his dad sees him and his dad runs and hugs him and gives him a kiss and tells his servants to make this big feast put this robe on put shoes on his feet dress him up say so we're going to feast tonight because my son that was lost is now found he was dead, now he's alive again. So there's nowhere you can go. It doesn't matter what you've done in this world. Run to God, whatever you're going through. Marital trouble, financial trouble. Struggling to put food on the table, struggling to pay the bills. Addiction, depression, sickness, disease, sadness, mourning. Whatever it may be, just run to God with it. Give it to God. He loves you so much, He formed you with your hands, and there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing that you can do that He won't accept you. Because you think about that, about that prodigal son story. This son had just, I mean, He even said, I disrespected my father and God. But the dad did not wait for him to apologize. He didn't even give him the chance to say, I know I'm not your son anymore, that you won't accept me as your son, but please accept so He accepted him when he was sitting down the road. I mean, it was always forgiven. He was so happy to see his son for his son to come back. And that's exactly what God does for us. So there's nothing, nowhere you can go. There's nothing that you can do. Just turn to God, trust in Him in everything that you do. Seek God first, not last. Just run to Him. Just keep that in mind that no matter where you go, no matter what you do, Jesus loves you enough that He came and He died for you. Paid the price for you. Paid a debt that He didn't know. He was an innocent man. But He loved you enough that He died for you. So just keep that in mind and just Run to God first. Seek Him. He's always with you. There's, 
There's nowhere you can go to escape him. Well, I pray this message blessed you. God loves you so much. You are not alive by accident. You were created for a purpose. God did not create you just to fill the earth with people, just to take up space. And much like any good parent, God only wants the best for you. God has a plan for you. When God formed you in your mother's womb, God had a plan for your life. You know, we all have this void in our life. Some call it God-shaped hole, a missing puzzle piece. You try to fill it with everything that the world has to offer. Sex, drugs, alcohol, money, friendship, power, popularity, houses, cars, money. But nothing can fill that void. Only God. That's why they call it a God-shaped hole. That void is there because we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. There's none of us that are righteous, not one. That void, that sin is there because we live in a fallen world. Jesus is coming back to set up his earthly kingdom. And the requirement to enter this kingdom is that we must be absolutely perfect and without sin. But no one is without sin. We all mess up. We all miss the mark. We all sin. Sin means to break God's rules, neither thoughts or actions. We see here in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is perfect, no one, not one. We see that in Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's echoed in Ecclesiastes 7.20. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10 say, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In verse 10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So we're deceiving ourselves and calling God a liar if we say that we're perfect and don't sin. And there's a punishment for our sin. We see that in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We all face eternal judgment and separation from God. This is why we must receive Jesus into our life as Lord and believing what Jesus did is the greatest gift that we'll ever receive. It's a free gift of God of, of eternal life, not about works. No one can be saved by their own works. You cannot be a good enough person. We see here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Galatians 2, 16, Knowing that the man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We will never live long enough to even begin to pay for our salvation. Here's a word picture for you. If you don't accept Jesus' free gift, his get out of jail free card, and you stay in that spiritual jail cell, and the jailer opens the door and says that you're free to go someone paid your bill, but you're relying on your works, thinking you could be a good person, so you stay in that cell thinking that you can get your own way to heaven, that you doubt that there's only one way, that you think you can find your own way, saying, no, I'm good. I'm a good person. God wouldn't send me to hell. I could get myself out of here. But you can never be good enough, so don't deny this free get-out-of-jail ticket. You can still escape the spiritual jail cell. Because as you see, sin separates us from God. Not only does sin separate us from God, it's a valley gets deeper and wider with each sin. And that sin valley gets wider and deeper with every sin. So it separates us from God and man. You see how man is further from God now. Now the only way to atone for that sin and for God to fill that void in your life is by the shedding of blood. See it there, Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. You see, in the Old Testament, they would use the blood of an animal sacrifice. The animal sacrifice was a temporary bridge to God. Once they sinned again, they would have to offer another animal. Because as they sinned, that valley would get deeper and wider. And see, what, look at what happens. It causes the bridge to collapse. God knows that we can never be good enough. That's why Jesus came and died on the cross. Jesus is the only one who lived a perfect life and became the substitute for our sins. Jesus always existed. Jesus is God. Jesus left his throne in heaven. He became flesh. He wasn't an angel. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a prophet. He was flesh and blood and bone, fully God and fully man. He lived a perfect, sinless life. Jesus came to the earth to die for all of us. Jesus was crucified on a cross. 
died a brutal death, was buried in a tomb. He was in that tomb for three days and three nights, and then he rose from the dead, proving that he is God because death and the grave had no power over him. Jesus took our place, suffered God's wrath for us. The punishment that we all deserve, we've seen the wages of sin is death. We're guilty for our sins. We deserve the punishment. But the punishment was poured out on Jesus. God gave his son to the world to die in our place. Jesus paid God's price for our sins when he died on the cross. And our sins were nailed to the cross. Jesus nailed our sins to the cross with him. Jesus shed his precious blood for our sins. And Jesus' blood covered those sins so that we don't have to die. Jesus was sinless. He was an innocent of death. And like any innocent man wrongfully arrested, Jesus died for us because of our sin, because we're guilty. We deserve God's wrath. The wages of sin is death. But Jesus loves us enough to die for us. Jesus is truly the only way to the Father. There you see John 14:6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Because Jesus was perfect and never sinned, he was the only one worthy to pay the price for our sins. And just like the animal sacrifice had to be completely perfect with no spot, no blemish, no defect. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Paid our debt. We're free to go. Jesus paid our debt in full when he died on the cross. He purchased us, redeemed us, brought us back to him. Purchased us with his blood, shed on the cross for us. Jesus paid for our sins long before we ever committed them. We see that in Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love towards us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So long before we were ever born, Jesus paid the price for our sin in full. So don't wait until you overcome an addiction to your financially secure Go to God now. He will help you through anything and everything that you're going through. The gospel can be summed up in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't come to condemn you. He, he came and loved you. He knew that you couldn't be good enough, that you couldn't be perfect. So he came and died for you. Then Jesus ascended to the Father, ascended up to heaven. We're much like a courtroom. God the Father is the judge. Jesus, the Son of God, is our defense attorney. We see this in Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Also, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And Satan is the prosecutor. We see that in Revelation 12, 10. More so the last part where it says, the Satan's the accuser of the brethren, which accuses us before God day and night. So it's like a courtroom. The prosecutor tells God all our sins. As you see here, it says, see what they did? They're guilty. But Jesus, our defense attorney, says, our sins are stricken from the record. Our sins are forgiven. Jesus paid the fine with his blood on the cross. You see it, those sins are stricken from the record. I paid those sins in full. Your salvation is a free gift from God. So receive this free gift that Jesus gave you long before you were born. You know, Jesus wants to save us from the penalties of our sins and give us eternal life. But we must first, individually, receive him. We see in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Acts 3, 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And just like works don't get us into heaven, neither does just knowing who Jesus is. You have to have Jesus in your heart, have a relationship with him. There's a big difference between knowing Jesus intellectually. Like you see there, with the guy he's got in his mind, he knows about Jesus being on the cross. But there's a big difference between knowing him intellectually and having a relationship. So you see you got the one guy, he's got thinking about Jesus on the cross, this other one has Jesus in his heart. And they're hugging. So he's got a relationship with him. When you believe with Jesus in your heart, you talk to him in prayer. You read his word, the Bible. You put Jesus first before your family, before your job, before your money, whatever it may be. I like to think of it this way. Our sins put us in a jail, in a spiritual jail. So 
where we await our trial. Then suddenly the door opens. The jailer says that we're free to go. Someone paid our bill. That was Jesus. Jesus paid our bill. But we're running out of time. Jesus is really coming back soon. So we need to repent. Come back to God while you still can. Repent means to turn away, to change your mind, to do a 180, make a U-turn change your behavior. It's that simple. It's ABC simple, in fact. Ask for admit you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Admit you can't do this on your own. Admit that you need Jesus. Be as for believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he was. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. Believe that Jesus paid the price for your sins. Believe that Jesus did it all for you. See his call or confess. Call on the name of the Lord. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Confess that Jesus is Lord. Confess and repent of your sins. Talk to God. Prayer is a conversation with God. And since he's present everywhere, you can speak aloud, talk in your head, he will hear you. On the screen is a sample prayer you can say, or you can use your own words, just as long as it's from your heart. That's what we've seen in Romans 10, 9 and 10. you got to believe in your heart. you got to really mean the words, and when you do, you'll be saved. But it's not about the prayer, it's about making that realization that you can't do this on your own. Prayers, ABCs of Salvation, that's just a tool, but it's not what saves you. What saves you is having a complete repentance to changing your attitude and wanting to seek God, wanting to have a relationship with Him. And repentance, you know, it's it's changing your attitude. I mean, I give this example that if I keep doing wrong to you and keep apologizing, but don't change my behavior, it's not going to mean anything. You're not going to accept my apology after a while. But if I if I say I'm sorry and I change my behavior and I don't treat you like that anymore, then you can even, you can forgive me easier. That's what repentance is: is changing your mind. You know, you're you're changing your attitude. You're not you're not doing repeating the same thing. I mean, we're all gonna mess up, but it's the I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna change my behavior. We have to change the behavior. We're saved through faith in Jesus. It's a free gift from God, 100% free. Don't think that you gotta be good enough to earn it somehow because you can't. Just repent and believe in Jesus, then you'll be saved. But you must have a personal relationship with Jesus. Go to God first, not last. Wherever you are, God is with you. God created you for a reason. When you accept Jesus' free gift and invite Jesus in your life, then God gives you a new heart and begins to mold you into who he created you to be. God is continually molding us because even though we are saved, we will still sin because we're unfinished. God is working on us. It's like these Legos. I figured this is kind of the best explanation I can do. You see this Lego, it's just, dump, it's just a pile, right? It's like when you dump a, dump a box of Legos on a table. You're going to get a pile like this. It's not going to look like a house until you start stamping those bricks together. That's what God's doing. He's continually, just like snapping these bricks together, he's continually molding us into who he created us to be. It's not just a dump them out on the table and it's a house. No, it's a pile like that. That's a, just a pile of mess. He, now we got to snap the bricks together to make the house. That's what God's doing with us. But read the Bible for yourself, because with all the deception in the world, the Bible is the only truth in the world. You need to know what the Bible says for yourself, because Jesus' return is imminent. He's coming soon. We see all the signs that Jesus talked about happening worldwide. Banks failing, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in diverse places, famines, pestilence. So don't wait, don't put Jesus off. Give your life to Jesus today while you still have the opportunity. Jesus paid the price for you as a free ticket waiting for you to enter into heaven. And all you have to do is take the opportunity today, turn to Jesus, and accept that free gift. And do it before it's too late. You don't have time to wait. Tomorrow might be a one day too late. I love you. Jesus loves you. I can't wait to see what the Lord has for us tomorrow. See you tomorrow, God willing. Or maybe we'll see you in the clouds. Have a great day.